ages 3 to 11, to go to their class tonight. The rest of us, we're going to go to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 3, verse number 4. Titus chapter 3, verse number 4. Titus is known sometimes, maybe in some circles, as Paul's second son. Of course, Timothy would be considered his first son. And when I say son, I mean in the gospel, not in a literal material sense, a genetic sense, you know. In Titus chapter 3, verse number 4, I was telling somebody, I was on the phone on the way to church, somebody out of state, and I said, man, this is the shortest message um, on paper that I've had in a long time that the Lord gave me tonight, but I, I just really feel like it's for us tonight. Now, we'll probably go a lot of places that aren't on the sheet here tonight and look at some things, but we just want to talk about the kindness and love of God. Now, God, mankind is creating the image of God, and so mankind is the image of God. We have emotions. We have all types of emotions. And uh, the reason we have all of these types of emotions is because we're in the image of God. So God has emotions. You know, you'll read in the Old Testament about he's a jealous God. You know, he doesn't want people doing idolatry and all these things. He's holy. He's love. Well, a couple of things that he is as well, Scripture tells us, is he's kind and he is love. And so you always have to balance that out. One of the things that happens in some people's Christian life, if you go too far overboard with God being kindness and love, well, then people begin to justify everything they do. Well, I know I can sin a little bit and I'll still make heaven. And you hear all these things that are just not true. They're not scripturally true. Uh, at the same time, if you go too far the other way, that uh, God is just a God of terror and hellfire all the time, you're only getting one perspective of God. You're not understanding that he is love, that he is grace, that he is mercy. He does have his hands outstretched. So tonight we're going to look at the kindness and the love of God. And that's in Titus chapter 3, verse number 4. It says, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. I wonder if we could, let's just ask God together to uh, do everything he wants to do with the word of God tonight. The word of God is quick, it's powerful, it created the worlds. There's a lot that goes on with the ministry of the word of God. It gives us faith. Let's pray together. God, I glorify you. I love you, Lord Jesus Christ. We do just ask you, I ask you to have the word of God. Let it have free course tonight in our lives, God. Let it be a hammer, Jesus. Let it be seed to the sower, God. Let it be like a fire shut up in our bones, God, in the name of the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ. Let it be water to wash us, God. And let us receive with meekness, God, this engrafted word which is able to save our souls, God. God, open every heart. Let everybody hear. God, be good ground to receive the word of God. And God, will give you all the glory and the honor and the adoration. I thank you, God. God, I praise you. I adore you. I worship you, God. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I wonder if we could just go ahead and glorify the Lord because he's so good. I love you, Jesus. I praise you, God. Amen. Hallelujah. So Titus. Now, who is Titus? Well, you, you find Titus kind of scattered all throughout Scripture. In 2 Corinthians, he's mentioned eight times. He also plays a, a big role in the book of Galatians, the second chapter and the third chapter, and in 2 Timothy as well. Now, in 2 Timothy, it kind of indicates that while Paul was in a very big struggle in his life, uh, Titus abandoned him. It says Titus went to Dalmatia. And uh, the book of Titus is one of the pastoral epistles in the New Testament, along with First and Second Timothy. And the reason they call them pastoral epistles is because both Titus and Timothy were evidently pastors of some sort, leaders in the early church, and younger than Paul. So um, we're going to start off kind of reading the background. Um, you know, verse 4 says, but after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appears. So it, it kind of indicates we need to read what is before that. So we're just going to start at Titus chapter 3, verse number 1. 
And uh, Titus is telling, excuse me, Paul is telling Titus what to say to the people in the island of Crete. Now, the Cretans were a tough bunch. I mean, they were just wild. It, it says in 112 of Titus, Paul begins to describe the Cretans. And this is where Titus is ministering at the time to the Cretans. It says, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. And then Paul doesn't say, oh, bless their heart, don't say that. Paul said, this witness is true. And then he says, verse 13 of chapter 1 in Titus, Wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. So Paul says, look, Titus, I know you're in a tough battle there. The people you're witnessing to are always liars, they're evil beasts, and they're slow bellies. So I want you to rebuke them sharply. That's pretty tough, isn't it? Don't you like reading the Bible? Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus isn't just always, you know, got the little children on his lap. Sometimes he's, he's got a whip driving people out of, the, <laughs> out of the temple. Again, you've got the goodness and the kindness and the severity of God. So, in Titus chapter 3, verse 1, he has to tell them, these evil beasts, these liars, these slow bellies, he said, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. Now, when we see the term principalities and powers, so often we go to like Ephesians chapter 6 and think about spiritual principalities and powers. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. This is not what that's talking about. Principalities and powers in this particular context context is talking about um, like judges and like congressmen and like um, the city council and these type things. So he says obey your government. As long as your government is obeying God, obey your government. So he said you've got to put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates which would be the judicial, judicial system, to be ready to every good work. So we should always be ready to do a good work, shouldn't we? Amen. I appreciate those that uh, painted. Amen. That's a good work. Those that went to the nursing home not long ago. These were all good works. So be ready for good works. And then verse 2, it says to speak evil of no man. And that's very difficult for some people. That's some people's sin that does so easily beset them. They just like to talk bad about people. And uh, everybody's got their opinion. And it's even sometimes easy in the apostolic church. You know, if President Obama's in there, start talking about President Obama. If President Trump's in there, start talking about President Trump. What the Bible says, speak evil of no man. That's right. We're all in the image of God, and we're all trying to win everybody to Jesus Christ. So speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers. And now think about this, who he's witnessing to. Liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And then he's saying, okay, you better tell these people, submit to governmental authority, quit fighting, <laughs> no brawlers. This is like fist fighting. But gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers. And just put an E on there, the modern term diverse is there. Serving divers, lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So he's like, you know, tell the Cretans to do all these things and don't worry. We all kind of had a rough upbringing. Paul puts himself in there. Let's see how many things he says uh, in verse 3. He says, we ourselves were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So Paul in one verse says, yeah, we all had nine bad things going for us there. And uh, so this is the reason. I mean, nobody can be prideful. Nobody can uh, be exalted. Nobody can be a Pharisee because everybody's had some of those nine attributes in their life. But then he gets to verse 4, which is our subject tonight. He says, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. So the thing he's saying is, is while you were those nine things, 
While you were those nine things, what did God do? When you were hateful, hating one another, you know, mean, what did God decide to do? He became a man. He came to earth to save us from our sins. I mean, that is just the most amazing thing. God, you hear me say this a lot, God didn't come to earth because we're so good. God came to earth because he's so good. God came to earth because we had a debt we could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. So Jesus came to earth just because he loved us. It is his sovereign love, his sovereign kindness towards us. It was just something that he did. He makes the sunrise in this area, on this world. I mean, there's horrible people on the world. Sometimes we can't fathom how evil the world is. And we hear about it sometimes in the news, but the world is far more evil than the news would even present. I mean, it is horrible. It's weak. People are going against God all around the world. And God has his son come up on them just like he does on somebody that's praying, fasting, and seeking God. I mean, he just does. And so God is good like that. The most evil person in Albany can go to Walmart and shop for groceries just like the best Christian in Albany can. Why? Because God is a merciful God. He's a kind God. Now, that doesn't make sense to us sometimes on the carnal mind, but we have to realize that the life we're living right now is just a vapor. It is just a, a parenthetical. It is just a moment of time. It is like the wind that appears and passes away. It's like the sparks fly upwards on a bonfire. That's all our life is. And so, in eternity, the good's going to get blessed really good, unbelievably good, and the bad are going to be cursed really bad, unfathomably bad. So sometimes in this short space of time, we want justice to prevail. Justice prevails eternally, but not necessarily in the specifics. All right. And so God, in his great mercy, just decided, I'm going to come and take every sin. I'm going to take Steve Waldron's sin, Sister Shantae McCoy's sin, Brother Stanley's sin, Sister Clark's sin. I'm going to take everybody's sin that has ever lived, and I'm going to put it on my back at Calvary. And nobody's going to have a choice in this. I'm not going to ask anybody about it. But I am just going to come and provide enough salvation for the entire world. And so this is the great kindness and love of God. So sometimes we forget that God is a very kind God. The term kindness means moral excellence, virtue, good, integrity. The word kind is used in some fashion 237 times in the Bible, according to my computer. 215 verses. It doesn't always mean moral excellence. So sometimes it's talking about like in the animal species, a kind, a genus, that type of thing. The Bible constantly refers to God as kind, and it admonishes believers to be kind. If we were to just list out scriptures here tonight, so often it talks about the kindness of God, and it also talks about that, uh, you know, as we're growing in Christ, that one of the highest stages of growing in Christ is brotherly kindness. Just being kind to each other. You don't have to be grumpy. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to be mad. You don't have to be anything. You can be kind. It doesn't cost anything to be kind. I think it's really important, especially in the day and age that you and I live in, where Satan right here in the United States of America is bringing so much division, so much, that when you go into a store, if you're physically able, if you're, if you're someplace, to say thank you, to say uh, please, to say I appreciate it, to hold the door open for somebody. I think it's very important to share kindness with people because that's what God does for us. God shines and shares kindness with, again, as we've already talked about, with everybody on planet Earth. 
He's kind to everybody. And so this is what God is calling you and I to be as well. God extended his kindness to us arbitrarily. We deserve to die and to spend eternity in hell, but God is kind to us all. When, if somebody, and, and the Bible talks about hell has enlarged itself, and wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in. The people that end up in hell will not be able to talk about the kindness of God. They're not going to be able to say, the reason I went to hell is because God wasn't kind. God in his kindness, he lighted. It says that Jesus Christ is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Every man is born with God emanating in their minds saying, I love you, I care for you, I exist, seek me. And it is our hardened hearts that stop that. If it stops. Everybody here tonight pretty much, you know, you, you followed it. In the Holy Ghost. You kept going with it. So God's kindness, his love towards us has reached out a helping hand to all mankind. I'm thankful for that. How about you? Amen. Let's go to verse 5. We're going to come back, Lord willing, to verse 4. But let's go to verse 5. It says, not by works of righteousness, Titus 3, 5, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Now, there's a, there's a plan of salvation. There's a way he saved us. How did he save us? By the washing of regeneration. That's water baptism in Jesus' name. And renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And so God, just by his mercy, just by his sovereign grace, it wasn't by works of righteousness that he made a doorway. He says, here is heaven. Here is abundant life. Here is eternal life. But the doorway is water and spirit. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Renewing of the Holy Ghost probably referring back to that which Adam lost in the Garden of Eden. That God renews it to mankind. People in the Old Testament could not receive the Holy Ghost, but Adam being in the image of God would have been created with the Holy Ghost, so to speak. That's what many people believe anyhow. And so this is the method that God has chosen for us to go to heaven. The mercy of God is expressed by water and by spirit. By water and by spirit. So we deserve to die, spend eternity in hell, but God is kind to all. Now, verse 6, the renewing of the Holy Ghost, listen to this. It says, which he shed on us abundantly. I just think that's so cool. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. You know, when people are getting the Holy Ghost, we got to remember this. That they're not getting a drop. They're not getting like the rich man in Luke 16 that's in hell that says Lazarus just, you know, send Lazarus over to dip his finger to give me one touch. He has shed the Holy Ghost out on us abundantly. God's got a lot more Holy Ghost and we've got problems. He's got a whole lot more power than we've got issues. So the Holy Ghost is poured out abundantly. When you're at the store, the Holy Ghost has been poured out. It's just up to those, the workers and the clerks to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And we're just ambassadors to try to share it with them. So God has poured out the Holy Ghost abundantly on planet Earth. Can you say amen? I'm glad about it. I think we just ought to glorify the Lord about that. Hallelujah. He shed it on us abundantly. In the Old Testament, there was a deluge of water for destruction. In the New Testament, there's a deluge of living waters for life. One covered the earth, this one covers the earth. And it's just for whosoever will. In the Old Testament flood, under judgment, if you opened your mouth, you drowned. In the New Testament, if you open your mouth and cry out for heaven, you get salvation. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's right. So what was judgment in the Old Testament, typologically is salvation in the New Testament. He shed it out abundantly. I'm thankful for the flood of the Holy Ghost. 
Amen. I'm thankful for the flood of the Holy Ghost. All right, so let's go back to uh, verse 4. It says, but after the kindness. Let's everybody say kindness. Kindness and love of God our Savior toward man has appeared. Now, God our Savior, let's look at that. Let's go to Titus 1.3. The last three words in Titus 1.3 is God our Savior. If you go to Titus 1.4, the last three words is Christ our Savior. This shows us clearly that Christ is Almighty God. There's one Savior, that God is our Savior. The love of God our Savior toward man appeared. So God, who is a spirit, who is holy, came into the realm of sinful mankind sovereignly just to save us. That is a beautiful, beautiful message. You can study all the other religions and all the other myths of all of the world and not find anything that comes even remotely close to the love of God, that there was a God who had compassion and love and kindness on mankind to come and save them. Usually it's about judgmental gods who are angry and who are self-serving. If you were to read the Greek mythologies and all this kind of stuff about those guys, I don't even want to mention their names, all the Greek mythologies and all that kind of stuff, it would be terrible, it would be horrible, and they had human characteristics in their worst form in fallen mankind. But when you read about God, when you read in the Bible, you're reading about a God who has mercy, who has has compassion, who loves us, and who adopts us into his family, who takes us from being paupers and makes us princes in his wonderful kingdom. He makes us sons and daughters of the Almighty God. I'm thankful for that here tonight. Hallelujah. How many of you love the love of God? Amen. We all need to be in awe of the love of God, the grace and mercy of God. Now, and that being said, remember, don't ever forget that there is a justice and a holiness and a, a, a judgment aspect of God. But we do need to be in awe of the grace of God. When you get a bad attitude, God just doesn't strike you dead, usually. That's a good thing. Hallelujah. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 talks about God being love. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Some people are like, well, I wish God would do that. Well, the thing is, is everything God is doing in this dispensation is for redemption. That's the reason, you know, people call this the day and the age of grace. Because the grace of God, God is trying to get everybody saved. Mankind is doing everything possible to not be saved. I, I was on the internet, I think it was yesterday, and one of the news articles, they showed a picture of the European Parliament. And the European Parliament is built, one of the buildings of the European Parliament, it's built like the Tower of Babel. It's an incomplete tower. And it's made after a famous picture of the Tower of Babel an artist did uh, several decades ago. It's a Tower of Babel. Mankind is trying to rebuild the Tower of Babel. God is trying to build the kingdom of heaven. God's wanting to get you in the new Jerusalem. Mankind is trying to get a false new Jerusalem. It's going to have a false Christ, false religions, everything else about it. False miracles, lying miracles. Friend, I want to be in the truth. I want the real thing. You know, I've never been more stunned by an understanding of Scripture, and we'll get to 1 John 4 in just a moment, than I was in Revelation 13. I may have mentioned this here on Sunday, but I, I feel like I need to mention it again. 13.8, Revelation 13.8. And it says, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. And it's talking about the Antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Man, you read that. What that's saying is, is if you're not saved, if your name's not written in the book of life, if you're not born again of water and spirit, you're going to worship the Antichrist in the end time hour. And so we can kind of see this winnowing, this dividing 
that's happening in the world today by people who love truth, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth. The Bible is called the word of truth. The church is called the pillar and the ground of truth. And people who are worshiping lies or believing lies. Lies, sin always leads to deception. It just does. God is a holy God, so when you're pure, God is a spirit. He's the spirit of truth. When, when you are holy, then you're in touch with a holy God who is truth. When you're in sin, you're in the devil's territory, and Satan is a liar and the father of it. So when you're in lies, excuse me, when you're in sin, which in lying is a sin, when you're in sin, you're going to believe a lie. And people are going to actually make laws and things promoting sin. And the Bible says eventually God pours out a strong delusion where people believe a lie. He's like, if you desperately want to believe a lie, I'll help you. I'll give you a strong delusion, you know, Second uh, Timothy, excuse me, Second Thessalonians 2. So here we are. It, it says in Revelation 13, 8, if your name is not written in the book of life, if you're not saved, you worship the Antichrist. Now, hopefully, there's a pre-trib rapture of the church. But who knows? I mean, I, I still study that subject every day. Uh, I'd like for there to be a pre-trib rapture of the church. Hallelujah. But if there's not, just keep living for Jesus. <laughs> Regardless. I want to be looking for Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. All right. So 1 John 4, about God being love. 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. Remember, God chose John to say, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one to another. So it's not just church people you're supposed to love. It's your family. It's people that you're saved, you know, you live with and all this. And born again of water and spirit. And uh, so, beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Now, let me just share this with you. So often, we say the sign, we know that the sign of the initial infilling of the Holy Ghost is speaking in tongues, right? When you, when you get the Holy Ghost, you speak in tongues, don't you? All right. Where people mess up is they think that is the sign of the continued presence of God. The sign of the continued presence of God is that you love one another. Now, you should still speak in tongues often. Paul said he spoke in tongues more than us all. But this is what throws people because after somebody's received the Holy Ghost, then for whatever reasons, and this is not the subject of this message tonight to go into this, people can still speak in tongues but live like the devil. So... Speaking in tongues is the initial sign and evidence of the Holy Ghost. But everybody that's born of God will love each other. And so if you don't love each other, because I've known a lot of people that speak in tongues, and man, they don't love anybody. I mean, they're mad at the world. They hate the world. They want to kill the world and everything else. And... Uh, so when they're speaking in tongues, you might say, well, how does that happen? Again, that is not the subject of this message tonight, but uh, that's a subject for discussion on how that happens. But we know from observation that happens. And so let's go back to 1 John 4, 7 and 8, the kindness and love of God. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Now, this is saying you will never know true love till you're born again of water and spirit. You will not. You can imitate it because you're created in the fallen image of God, but you can't know true love till you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I, I didn't write it. This is just in the book. It's not our opinions. It's in the Bible. Amen. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So if you don't love, 
not with the world's perverted definition of love. The definition of love scripturally, really, when it's talking about God, is spiritual best. I want your spiritual best. I want to do whatever it takes for you to go to heaven. You want to do whatever it takes for me to go to heaven. That's true love. I don't love you if I don't try to get you to go to heaven. If I leave you in your... If, if, if you are sick side the road, like in the parable of the Good Samaritan, in the story of the Good Samaritan, if you're just sick side the road, and I pass by on the other side, I don't love you. I've got to come minister to you and pour in the oil and the wine into your wounds. I've got to take you on my beast, and I've got to put you up in the hotel. I've got to give you some food and drink. I've got to take care of you. And so this is true love. And so the kindness and love of God, our Savior, has appeared. And so this is God. He's come to seek and to save that which was lost. God is going throughout the entire world. Tonight, he is everywhere. God is at the bar. There's a little bar down here on the end of Cordial Road before you get to the pilot on the left. And I always pray because usually there's two cars there. Sometimes, like on a big night, there's five cars there. I don't know. I mean, oh, maybe there's 50 cars sometimes. But I don't go by there when there's 50 cars. I go by, but like almost every time I go by there, I, I try to, I'm like, God, save those people in there. Because could you imagine you go spend your hard earned money to sit in this little dive and just and somehow you think that's living, you know, and, and I mean, they can have life and that more abundant. That's the reason the people that know God, we need to have life and we need to have it more abundantly. We need to have the joy of the Lord, the power of the Holy Ghost, you know, the gifts of the Spirit in our lives, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We don't need to let anything stop us. Can you say amen? Amen. So the kindness and love of God, our Savior, has appeared. And he poured out that Holy Ghost abundantly. I mean, we're swimming in the Holy Ghost right now. I appreciate my pastor. He used to talk about the Holy Ghost, and, and y'all have all heard this many times, probably from me, maybe some of you not so much, about he would say, you know, in this room right now are radio waves. And Sister Anderson, now a radio is something with an antenna, and it's like things like 93.1, and uh, 90.7. I'm having to explain this because some of our younger people are like, what's a radio? All I know is Pandora and uh, whatever else. What's some of the other ones? Not Netflix. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just kind of half joking there. I'm sorry. It was a bad joke. But you know what I'm saying? So you have to explain what a radio is. So maybe we should say there's Wi-Fi everywhere, or the Internet, or LTE, or 4G. There's 4G everywhere. Well, let's go back to radios. I think we all know what radios are. And so we can't see the radio waves, but they're everywhere. But if you were to turn it to 90.7, which is one of my favorite stations, I really like 90.7 FM, if you were to turn it there, you would begin to hear the Martins. You would begin to hear the Gaither vocal band. You would begin to hear, you know, uh, Karen Peck in New River. You would begin to hear somebody speaking the word of God. You'd begin to hear these things because we can't see it, but when the frequency gets right, we can hear it. And that's the way the Holy Ghost is. The world is swimming in the Holy Ghost. And when people get their frequency just right, you can hear it. You'll speak in tongues. When you repent of your sins and ask God to feed you with the Holy Ghost, you, you'll feel the Holy Ghost will come. You'll hear it. And that's what it means by he poured out the Holy Ghost abundantly upon us. Remember he poured out the Spirit upon all flesh? It's not in all flesh yet, but it's on all flesh. 
He poured out the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful for that tonight. So the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared. I am so thankful for that. Church, we never need to forget the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. We need to realize that is our mission. We need to share it with everybody that we can. We need to have a passion for it. We need to pray about it. We need to talk in tongues. We need to tear down strongholds. We need to see the power of the Holy Ghost. Paul had told Titus, you know, he told Titus, you're dealing with liars, you're dealing with evil beasts, you're dealing with slow bellies, you're dealing with brawlers, you're dealing with people that aren't submitted to authority. But the love of God still came to you and came to them. Hallelujah. Let's just talk to Jesus right now. God, I glorify you. I love you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. I love your people. God, we're so thankful that you, 2,000 years ago, came to earth. And God, you took our sins 2,000 years later in the future. And you put them on your back and you nailed them to the cross. God, I am so thankful. I am so thankful, Jesus, that on an upper room one day there was a bunch of people praying. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And now the Holy Ghost is for whosoever will. God, I'm thankful we're living in a day of grace. God, let us share your grace, love, and mercy with every soul, every person, God. Minister to everybody here tonight. God, I feel like somebody here tonight needs your grace, needs your mercy. They've sinned. God, let them ask forgiveness. Any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for it, God. Thank you for it, God. Thank you for it, God. Let's pray just another few moments. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost here. God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let your truth permeate our spirits, oh God. Glory to the name of Jesus. I love you, God. I worship you, God. I praise you, God. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask if you'd be so kind, if you can physically, if you could stand once again all over this building. And I know we've already done this once. I just feel like we need to do it again. But pray for somebody. And don't do it out of tradition. Pentecostals can get in traditions just like anybody else. Do it in fervency. Pray for somebody. Pray and ask God to bless somebody in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It may be you standing in the need of prayer. Why don't you just receive it in the Holy Ghost? Let's everybody talk to Jesus together. Thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost, God, that's here tonight. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your power, God, in Jesus' name. God, thank you. I glorify you, God. Jesus, thank you for truth. Thank you for anointing. Thank you for love, Jesus. Thank you for power. God, I glorify you. I worship you. I magnify you, God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let us be strong in the Lord, in the power of your grace, God. Let us be strong in the grace of God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, we know you're soon to come. God, we want to be right with you, God. You've poured out the Holy Ghost abundantly on us, oh God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's for whosoever will. God, it's everywhere. It's 